that helps verify these writings were about real people in real places at real times in history. Uh, too many people attack what they think are unbelievable events of the scriptures. Uh, they'd have us believe that the Bible is some fairy tale book of myths that's only about a couple of naked people in a garden with talking serpents and donkeys. And because the Bible is so vigorously attacked in these areas, it causes people to think that there's nothing about its contents which are historically verifiable. Uh, and so that's an extreme falsehood. Today, instead of trying to erode your faith in the scriptures, which a lot of skeptics make it a goal to do, uh, we want to help build your confidence in the words of scripture. And we want to do that by noting one particular field of research. We just want to look at archaeology. This is very much a, a lecturish uh, type of lesson here. Um, and we're going to take a look at, at archaeology for a few minutes here this evening. Um, and specifically, the archaeology of the Old Testament. Um, let's define our terms first of all, so you understand what the word archaeology means. Maybe that's not familiar to you. Um, our word archaeology comes from two Greek roots. It comes from a Greek word, archaeos, which is where we get words like archaic or archaeology. Uh, archaeos means old or ancient. And then you have combined that Greek root with another Greek word, logos, which is a word we should be pretty familiar with because uh, the word became flesh. That's the logos in Greek as you read John 1. But the word logos is where we get the ology that's at the back of so many fields of research. It means word, treaties, or study. Um, and so archaeology, um, if we were to just take the word at its literal meaning it means the study of antiquity the study of that which is ancient here's a definition from Merriam webster's collegiate dictionary they said it's the scientific study of material remains like fossils and relics and artifacts and monuments of past human life and activities now that's their definition of archaeology so with this in mind the archaeologist's job is to take what remains from a society and to reconstruct what the artifacts tell us about that society or about that those people we're going to briefly look at what really the purpose of archaeology is then uh, the purpose of archaeology um, is basically basically to tell us about people places things and events that took place in the past let's let alfred horth uh, tell you what the purpose is he says the most important contributions of archaeology to biblical studies are the various ways it illuminates the cultural and historical settings of the bible it adds to our knowledge of the people places things and events in the bible and aids in translation and exegesis of biblical passages um, so think about people first of all Ar archaeology is a resurrection of forgotten people uh, little was known in the past, for example, about the Hittites, or about the Arameans, or about the Sumerians, or the Canaanites, or the Philistines. Really, until recently, archaeologically, in the past one to two hundred years. It used to be believed that the Hittites weren't even a real people. The people, people used to, skeptics used to attack the scriptures and say, well, there's no such thing as the Hittites. We have no evidence of these Hittite people. And now you can take a college course in Hittite history because there's been so much um, study done on those people, so many things found archaeologically about those people uh, that no one denies that uh, they were certainly a people that existed in the past. Uh, archaeology tells us about places. Uh, I think it's important that we use up-to-date maps and atlases of Bible places, and archaeology helps us to improve those resources and those tools. Uh, it helps us to identify biblical sites more precisely. Uh, there's been several jar handles from Gibeon that have been found in excavations. There have been inscriptions, including Derby and Gezer, as well as Thyatira, that have provided archaeological evidence that these were real sites in ancient history, and archaeology helps us to improve our knowledge of those places that existed um, in scriptures and of course many of those places still exist today but have been rebuilt uh, several times uh, it tells us about things archaeology tells us about things I've got in my office a little oil lamp uh, that was given to me as a gift it was dug up 
um, in Palestine. It's the same type of lamp that you would have uh, seen the, the five wise and foolish virgins using in Matthew chapter 25. A lot of people think that's a big lamp they would have held in their hands with the handle. No, it's a small lamp that fits in the palm of your hand. Um, but when we dig these things up, we learn more about what those lamps would have looked like, uh, what they felt like. Um, I've got jar pieces from Jericho and from Qumran um, in my office as well that have been given to me by other people who've actually been there and been involved in those excavations. And uh, it helps you just get a mental picture of what these things that are mentioned in Scripture uh, certainly look like during the times that they were being used. And of course, archaeology tells us about events as well. And we can read writings in uh, cylinders and on inscriptions and in tablets that tell us about wars that took place. It helps us to confirm some of the Bible wars that we read about, events like that. Um, archaeology is a very powerful piece of evidence, I think, to, to help us confirm the scriptures. A Reformed Jewish scholar, Nelson Gluck, and this is him on the front of Time magazine years ago, he says, as a matter of fact, however, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a single properly understood biblical statement. Now, that's a big statement for a Jewish scholar to make because he's not just saying archaeology um, has, helps confirm the Old Testament, which he is a Jew, only believes in. It also confirms uh, things that we see in the New Testament, the Old and New. He says, no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a single properly understood biblical statement. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or in exact detail historical statements in the Bible. And he writes that in Rivers in the Desert, and a lot of folks have quoted him on that. Josh McDowell writes in the New Evidence that Demands a Verdict. This is a great book. So you get to the four spiritual laws at the end of the book, but the rest of it's really good. He says, archaeology contributes to biblical criticism, not in the area of inspiration or revelation. Archaeology doesn't tell us that the Bible is inspired. That's what he's trying to say here. Instead, it confirms the historical accuracy and trustworthiness of the events recorded. Um, so it helps us confirm. Um, let's, let's illustrate that for a minute. Um, I mentioned it doesn't prove the Bible's inspired. I, I believe the Bible's inspired. I've already quoted that to you. Uh, but we can't use archaeology to prove that, and it's important that we not say that because archaeology doesn't prove that the Bible's inspired. Um, that's not really our goal. Our goal today and what we our goal really with archaeology is to simply illustrate through archaeological discoveries the historical trustworthiness of the Bible. For example, um, our, our, our trust and our confidence in an individual, it increases if we always find that individual accurately representing whatever he may tell us. Um, let's say mom and dad run a business, and so let's say that they have a worker um, who they've noticed is not getting jobs done in a fair amount of time. Um, and it seems as though sometimes when they call that worker, that worker is not where that worker says he is. Um, and other people have noted that this worker is you know, hanging out at Village Pantry or at your local Krispy Kreme or um, just going places that they're not supposed to go. Hanging out at his girlfriend's house for a couple hours or just going home and taking a nap for an hour or two. And so you start to notice that he's not very trustworthy. So what you do, and I know what, what a lot of businesses do now, is you put a GPS in his phone. You put a GPS on the vehicle that he's driving. And then when you call said worker and you ask them where they are, um, and they tell you something that you can see on your computer screen is not true, it helps you realize they're not being trustworthy. On the other hand, when you call and they are exactly where you can see on your computer screen they are supposed to be, and you see that happening over and over again, time and time again, you start to realize this person is a trustworthy person. And you, you build confidence in that person. You get to the point where I don't really have to check on that person anymore because I know they're a trustworthy person, and they've proven that. Well, that's really kind of what archaeology does for us with the scriptures. It corroborates um, historical theses. It can most certainly confirm 
the biblical record in the areas where it is tested. It helps us build confidence that what we read in our scriptures is historically accurate and trustworthy. And this is why archaeology is an important field of evidence, because it helps us to know that certain people, places, things, and events, they're not fictitious legends like a lot of people would like to make them out to be. They're a matter of real historical record. Joseph Free says this in his book, Archaeology and Bible History. In addition to illuminating the Bible, archaeology has confirmed countless passages which have been rejected by critics as unhistorical or contradictory to known facts. Um, Miller Burroughs mentions this, though, and this is kind of what I've already alluded to here, and that is archaeology can tell us a great deal about the topography of a military campaign, it can tell us nothing about the nature of God. And that's true. You can't dig up a, a, a jar in the earth and, and that tell you something about the nature of God. It tells you that that jar existed sometime in the past, um, and that's, that's kind of what it can tell you. Um, and you can put some clues together and help, under, help know kind of when that jar existed and maybe what time period and what people might have used it. And as you see more evidence like inscriptions and other things, you can learn more but it doesn't tell you anything about the nature of God. Uh, when we put two and two together, we can start having confidence in God's word because of what we find in archaeology, but that's not the purpose of archaeology. Um, and just another pitfall of archaeology, just something that you want to avoid with it, uh, and this is what Edwin Yamauchi mentions. He says, historians of antiquity and using the archaeological evidence have very often failed to realize how slight is the evidence at our disposal. It would not be exaggerating to point out that what we have is but one fraction of a second fraction of a third fraction of a fourth fraction of a fifth fraction of the possible evidence. Now you might hear that statement and think, eh, that's kind of a hit on archaeology. Um, but, but understand what he's saying here. Let's take, um, let, let's take Kevin Zarco right here. And let's say that we decide we, we want to research more about what kind of person Kevin Zarco was 3,000 years from now. How much information are we going to have about Kevin Zarko? Unless Kevin Zarko becomes president at some point, which is highly possible, a very capable man. But unless Kevin Zarko gets in some type of position like that, we may not know anything about Kevin Zarko 3,000 years from now. Why? Because all of his stuff is going to be thrown in the trash by somebody at some point down the road. You know, two, three, four generations from now, maybe people aren't going... Uh, to remember or, or keep all of the, the things that make Kevin Zarko who he is. We're not going to have as much historically. The computers that have information about, computer, the, about Kevin Zarko stored eventually are going to crash, and the technology is going to become obsolete, and we're not going to be able to use it. And that's the thing that's, that we see happening here with archaeology. Um, only a fraction of what is made or written survives. Uh, would you be able to reconstruct your entire life's history 3,000 years from now? Probably not. You'd be lucky if you could just get a, a glimpse or two so that someone knew that you were alive 3,000 years earlier. Um, and, and because we throw stuff away, things deteriorate, disasters happen like tornadoes and fires and thefts and floods, um, crap, things, things happen and get lost in the shuffle so we don't have um, all of the possible evidence that you could possibly have just because of that, because of time. Um, in addition to that, only a fraction of the available sites have been excavated. Uh, you, it, there's, there's certain places that have been built up and built on top of over and over again. Well, you can't go up underneath the earth and excavate under those places that have been rebuilt time and time again. Uh, and it costs money to do those things. And, and there's not enough money to go around. There's not enough archaeologists to go around. Um, there's not enough available land to dig up. And so that's why Yamauchi says what he does about we only have a small portion of what we could have um, historically because um, a lot of the research hasn't been done yet. But it's picked up quite a bit in the last century. Um, <clears throat> Josh McDowell further explains this, and then we'll take a look at the evidence. He says archaeology is a special kind of science. Physicists and chemists, they can do all kinds of experiments to recreate the processes they study and watch them over and over again, archaeologists cannot. They have only the evidence left from the one and only time that civilization lived. They study past singularities 
not present regularities. And because they can't recreate the societies they study, their conclusions can't be tested as can those of other sciences. Archaeology tries to find plausible and probable explanations for the evidence it finds, and for this reason, its conclusions are subject to revision. So that's some of the issues you might have with archaeology. Well, let's take a look at some of that archaeology. We've explained the field perhaps well enough now. Um, I just want to take a look at a few of the periods of archaeology um, that you find in the, the Old Testament. I want to start with the patriarchal age. When I say patriarchal age, I'm talking about the age where Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, uh, those people who are known as the patriarchs or the fathers, uh, the time when they lived. And a lot of research has really picked up on the patriarchal age since the discovery of the Nutsi tablets. Uh, Nutsi was excavated between 1925 and 1931. Uh, and there were about 2,000 clay tablets that were discovered uh, when Nutsi was excavated. Nutsi is a northeastern Mesopotamian city. You remember Abraham was from Mesopotamia. Um, and being from Mesopotamia, uh, you also find that they went back to Mesopotamia, to the city of Haran. That's where um, Isaac got his wife, Rebecca. That's where... That's where Jacob goes and finds Rachel and Leah. It's kind of a two for one there um, with his 14 years of work with Laban. But Mesopotamia was an area where those patriarchs were from, and that's where these tablets were found. Uh, they were excavated in the late 1920s. Um, but, but basically, these are tablets that were found, and they tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the history that we read about actually in the scriptures. Take, for example, Genesis 16, verses 1 and 2. This is something that we read. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Now a lot of people attack this. Uh, they can't believe that here is supposed to be a godly biblical figure who would go and, and actually have a child with his maidservant. Basically, Hagar's acting as a surrogate mother here. Uh, it's not called that in Scripture, but that's what we would call it today. We, we still kind of do the same thing today. We're just more medically advanced about it. Uh, but it does seem strange to us that Sarah suggested that Abraham father a child with Hagar. Yet the Nutsi tablets that have helped us shed more light on this. Uh, to help us see, this was a common practice in antiquity. Uh, Archaeology confirms the practice, then, of Genesis 16, 1 and 2. Take a look at this uh, quotation, which is found in Hearst Archaeology in the Old Testament. This is off of the Nutsi tablets. If Jalimnenu, this is an occurrence that took place in Mesopotamia with someone besides Abram and Sarah. If Jalimnenu, who is the bride, will not bear children... Then it says on this tablet, Jalindanu shall take a woman of Lululand, that's where the choicest slaves were obtained, for Shanaima, who is the bridegroom. Okay, If you can't have children, then you go and you find a slave and you have a child with her. You have the right to do that according to this culture. So what Abram and Sarai are doing is actually something that would have been probably common in their culture. And we see that and that helps shed some light on what we read in Genesis 16 when we see that it's occurred in Mesopotamia and it's recorded on these tablets for us. Here's another one uh, that might seem a little bit hard for us to believe. I mean, let's imagine your father was rich, had many possess possessions, much silver, much gold, a lot of land, and you were the oldest son and therefore you were generally the one who had the right to inherit all of those things, being the oldest son. And you sold all of that for a cup of stew, for a bowl of soup. It's a little hard to imagine that someone would do that, or even that they would be legally allowed to do that. That's exactly what we see taking place in Genesis 25, verse 29. Jacob cooked a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. Now, we would probably say, you've got to be kidding me, right? You, you, you want me to give away my inheritance for your cup of soup. Your soup is good, but it's not that good. 
But Esau was hungry, and Esau said, look, I'm about to die. What is this birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, and he ate and drank, arose, and he went his way. And thus Esau despised his birthright. Of course, this is mentioned in Hebrews uh, chapter uh, 12, I believe, as well. Um, but take a look, uh, and I want you to see this isn't a ridiculous, as some people might think. This was something that, again, occurred in Mesopotamia. It's recorded. Now, the following excerpt from Anutsi Tablet supplies one insight into this story. Here's what the tablet says. On the day they divide the grove, this was a piece of land, that lies on the road of the town to Lumtai, Tukatilla shall give it to Kerpatsa, I wonder how Ray's doing translating, um, as his inheritance share. And Kerpatsa has taken three sheep to Tukatilla in exchange for his inheritance share. Now look, he gets this entire grove for what? Three sheep. That's a pretty good deal. You get a nice chunk of land for three sheep. These types of transactions, here's what the archaeology does for us. It helps us to see these types of transactions were taking place in the area that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were living and helps confirm what we read in Scripture is certainly historically possible in mean, confirming the historical record. Take a look at one more patriarchal example here as we move through some of the patriarchs. But here's Joseph. Uh, the image that's shown here, showing up okay there, um, but the image that's shown here is a fragment of a fifth dynasty Egyptian relief. And it shows starving people. Now, why is that important? Well, reliefs and written inscriptions concerning famines and food distribution in each year of want show why Egyptians responded to Joseph's warning as they did. They took Joseph seriously when he said a famine was coming because, as it is documented here, famines had taken place, did take place in the days of Joseph, and these reliefs are actually an artistic representation of what the Bible tells us was happening in the days of Joseph, and certainly many other times as well. Take a look at this as well as we think about Joseph. Um, here's just a chariot uh, that was actually uh, found and has been found in one of the tombs uh, which was in one of the tombs of one of the uh, pharaohs around the same time that Joseph would have lived. Uh, King Tut's tomb had a golden chariot. This just simply confirms what the Bible says uh, when it talks about Joseph um, taking his father in a chariot down to Egypt this might have been what the chariot actually looked like. And this is still on exhibit in museums. It's a chariot replica of Yuya uh, from his tomb in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. And Genesis 46, 29, Joseph prepared his chariot for his father. It tells us they had chariots uh, in the days of Joseph. And we've actually uh, found the chariots in these Valley of the Kings. Here's another um, relief here. It's a depiction um, here of... It's, it's from a wall painting in the tomb of Minna. Now, Minna was a scribe of Thutmose IV. It's thought that, that Thutmose IV, or Thutmose III, was the pharaoh who was in power, perhaps, uh, during Moses' time. Uh, so this depicts the type of oppression that the Israelites were facing at the hands of Pharaoh in the days of Moses. You've read about that, certainly. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 11 Joseph had a very kind Pharaoh when he came there 400 years later. The Pharaoh is not nearly as kind in the days of Moses. In verse 11, it says, They set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Python and Ramses. Uh, depictions like this just simply indicate to us that artistically, uh, the things that we read about in scriptures have been recorded in art, and on walls and in other places. Uh, which confirm what we read about in Scripture, that there, were, there, was, there was slavery taking place and there was oppressive and abusive slavery taking place in the days of Moses. Again, this says Joseph. I should have put Moses on the slide there. But um, this is a depiction here. I'm not sure how well it, sh it sh shows up okay. I'm just going to put a, a word out that you guys need a better projector. I'm just throwing it out there for you. Um, <laughs> pictures would pop. It's just a few more lumens. Um, 
But this is a depiction of workers in an Egyptian brickyard from the tomb of Rechmeyer. He was the vizier of Thotmose III. Again, Thotmose III was thought to be the evil pharaoh in the days of Moses. These men are mixing clay, which is placed in simple rectangular molds to form bricks, and then they're laid out to dry. The bricks are later stacked. This entire depiction sort of shows you the whole process. And on the far right, there's a seated supervisor who's holding a staff and a worker who's transporting bricks to the building site. What is it that the multitude of Israelites were doing when they were in Egypt during the days of Moses, where they were making bricks? Pharaoh said, uh, they're starting to complain about doing work. Let's make them make bricks without straw. Well, here they are. They're making bricks, just like the Bible says. Archaeology confirms that was certainly one of the jobs of slaves in Egypt. Let's move on to the invasion and conquest of the land. And I'm only talking about a drop in the bucket today of the archaeological finds that exist. Just to show you that this field of research, if you're interested in history, is certainly interesting to read about, interesting to talk about with other people to confirm what we read about in our scriptures. Uh, but let's think about Jericho for a minute. Uh, a lot of people make fun of the idea of Jericho, right? They make fun of the idea that it's crazy to think that the people of Israel could just walk around Jericho for once, once, a, once every day for six days, and on the seventh day they walk around there uh, seven times, and then they shout, and the walls of Jericho fall down. Uh, who, who actually believes that that occurred? And yet, you can still dig up Jericho. They recently did another, they excavated Jericho several times, but they recently did another excavation of Jericho. Uh, this right here is a picture of Dr. Bryant Wood, and what he's pointing out there is a fallen brick from the excavation of the city of Jericho. Um, it was excavated earlier than Wood here uh, from 1930 to 1936 by Garstang, and um, Bryant Wood wrote about some of his findings in Jericho and Biblical Archaeology Review. Some people know that's a magazine. It's known as BAR as well, B-A-R, Biblical Archaeology Review. And Wood noted the collaboration that exists between the archaeological evidence and the biblical narrative. I'm just going to tell you six things that he noted. One, he noted that the city was strongly fortified. Of course, the Bible tells us that in Joshua 2, 5, 7. It was a, that's why it was an opposing city, because it was strongly fortified. And they've excavated it, and certainly excavations confirmed that. There were actually two sets of walls. There was a high wall, and then there was a, uh, there was a, a layer of dirt under that high wall, and then there was another wall. So you had to get through two successive layers of walls in order to get into the city. So it's a strongly fortified city for its day. Um, Wood also tells us the attack occurred just after harvest time in the spring. Remember what happened right before they went into Jericho? They had just crossed the Jordan River miraculously. The Jordan River, it, we know, is a miracle because the Jordan River overflows its banks in the springtime. And Joshua is important to note that was the time of year that they crossed it. And so uh, excavations have also pointed out that this was just after harvest time in the spring. Uh, it's also been found in Josh Joshua 6 and verse 1, uh, the inhabitants had no opportunity to flee with their food sheds. They excavated Jericho, and what they found were pots that were still full of grain in Jericho that were left there. Now, why would they have been left there? Well, they were left there because the city was not supposed to be plundered. Remember they were told not to go plunder the city? There was one guy who did it. It was Achan who did it, and Achan and his family are punished later because they did it, but that was also found that the city, despite the fact the walls were brought down, the city itself was not plundered. The city was burned, and you can see evidence of burning on that layer where Jericho was. And so all of these things that we found archaeologically Strongly fortified city, just after harvest in the spring. The inhabitants did not flee with their food. The walls were leveled. The city was not plundered. The city was burned. Confirm what we read in Joshua 6. This is not just some made-up, fictitious story. Jericho is a real place. It's been excavated. And, and the excavations actually point out to a T in many ways what we read in the biblical record. That gives us a lot of confidence and what we read when we read about Joshua and the fall of Jericho. It's not just a kid's story. 
It's not just a cool kid song. It's a real event that happened, and it's been documented archaeologically. Let's move to the United Kingdom and think about that for a few minutes. Uh, this is the United Kingdom of Israel. Let's think about Saul for just a moment. Um, this is uh, King Hussein's 1967 palace, which was built on Gibeah of Saul. The fortress identified here as, as Saul's residence at Gibeah, Horth writes, gives strength to the impression that Saul never became interested in the trappings of kingship. The excavated structure was small, its outer dimensions perhaps 170 feet by 115 feet. Everything excavated from within the compound, including a plowshare, remember what Saul hid behind when they were looking for him and anointed him as king? He hid behind a plowshare. There was actually a plowshare in his fortress. <laughs> Everything was ordinary, further emphasizing the rustic quality of Saul's kingship. Um, and so this, this palace was built over top of uh, Saul. Now, William Albright was the one to first excavate Gibeah. He did that from 1922 to 1933. And he found this Israelite fortress. He also found iron implements. Now, unfortunately, a large part of the remains were destroyed in the 1960s when King Hussein of Jordan uh, began building a palace on the site. But only the shell of his palace was built because of the Six-Day War. And when Israel took control of the area, the palace stood unfinished. And that's why it's an unfinished palace that you're looking at. Uh, but among the finds in Saul's palace at Gibeah, I think this is interesting, were also slingshots. Um, now, why is that interesting? Take a look at Judges 20 and verse 16 for just a moment. Remember where, what uh, tribe Saul was from? Saul's from the tribe of Benjamin. You remember what Benjamin was kind of known for? They had a lot of left-handed people. They had a lot of slingshot shooters. Um, Judges 20 and verse 16 says this, Among all this people, this is the children of Benjamin, verse 15 says, Among all this people were 700 select men who were left-handed, and everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. Isn't it interesting that Saul, who's from the tribe of Benjamin, uh, they unearth his fortress and they find slingshots there. Not only does that confirm what we read about the tribe of Benjamin in Judges 20, but do you remember what David used when he killed Goliath? Slingshot. And that's what they find here. Helps us understand this was a weapon that was being used. Um, so it, it, it helps, helps us understand the Bible is historically credible when it mentions those things with Saul and with David. Um, here, here's an interesting one, and, and <laughs> it's hard to see here. Yeah, yeah. Do you see this big pile right here? These folks are just kind of throwing things onto the pile, and, and one person is taking a tally. Well, those are hands right there, hands. Now, go to 1 Samuel 18. Notice something over there. 1 Samuel 18. Do you remember when David kills Goliath? Saul promised you ever kill Goliath, you're going to be free from taxes, and I'll let you marry my daughter, which turned out to be a huge curse to marry Saul's daughter. It's not, not fun. But 1 Samuel 18, we find there's a strange request of David for a marriage dowry. He asks, Saul asks David, says, you can have my daughter if you will find me and, and bring me 100 foreskins of the Philistines. If you don't know what a foreskin is, go home, go home and look it up. Ask your mom or something. If you're under 12, it's a little PG-13 illustration for you, so just wait till you're 13. But as a modern reader, we look at this and we read this, and we think Saul must have been nuts. And that sounds like just a made-up story. Who would in their right mind ask for that? Yet here is an Egyptian relief from Menet Habu, and it illustrates this ancient practice. And the practice is this, that after battle, these Egyptians are counting the number of slain enemies by taking a specific body part and counting it. In this case, it's the hands. For Saul, he wanted David to collect the foreskins of some Philistines. Um, 
Of course, David obeys Saul's request. He brings back double the amount he asked for. He doesn't bring back 100. He brings back 200. Four skins of Philistines in 1 Samuel 18, 25 through 27 documents it. Just simply helps illustrate what we read in scriptures, that this was certainly possible. It was something that was, that was done among other cultures, and certainly Saul could have asked for that from David as well. Here's another interesting inscription. Um, you see, this highlighted part right here is what we're really talking about on this inscription. But Abraham Biram writes in Bar, Biblical Archaeology, Archaeology Review, he says, A remarkable inscription from the 9th century BCE that refers to both the house of David and to the king of Israel. This is the first time that the name of David has been found in any ancient inscription outside the Bible. It wasn't until 1994 that this was published. And this is pretty recent research. Um, it says that the inscription refers not simply to a David, but to the house of David. The dynasty of the great Israelite king is even more remarkable. This may be the oldest extra-biblical reference to Israel in Semitic script. Uh, not only has this discovery been made, the Jebusite walls of David's Jerusalem, they've been discovered. You can still go see them if you tour Jerusalem today. The water shaft that Joab would have used to enter the city in 2 Samuel 5, 6 through 8 has been discovered. A lot of things during the United Kingdom have been discovered. Oh, it's not a clicker. That's a laser. Uh, let's move to Solomon uh, just quickly. Solomon did a lot of building during his time in, in Israel, right? Um, he was uh, built all kinds of stuff. He built the cities. We read in 1 Kings 9 and verse 15. He built the cities of Hazor, Megiddo, and Gezer. Now, Pharaoh Jenkins notes that gateways, walls, and other buildings from the Solomonic period have been found in these three cities. And the gates and walls follow the same architectural plan. Interestingly, it's, it's well known that Solomon had chariots and horsemen. Which, by the way, according to the law of Moses, it was a sin. Uh, for a king of Israel to trust in horses and to have horses. But Solomon had them anyway. Um, it was a part of his mechanized army. Megiddo has been called Solomon's stables because the structures are built similar to stables or to storehouses, which, again, is archaeological confirmation that certainly horses could have been in Megiddo um, in this, uh, this, this area that uh, was built by Solomon, according to Scripture. Move on to the divided kingdom and just notice a couple of examples with me. First Kings 22, 39. What's it say there? It says the rest of the acts of Ahab. We're talking about King Ahab here. Ahab may have been a jerk, by the way, but Ahab was brilliant. A brilliant jerk. Is that possible? Um, there's a lot of neat stuff that's come out about Ahab. He was very successful in many ways, not morally, but in many other ways. Ahab and all that he did, the ivory house which he built, and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Interesting that chapter 22 mentions the ivory house of Ahab. Uh, this house would have been in Samaria. Samaria was the capital um, of the northern kingdom of, it, of Israel. And excavations in Samaria have recovered about 200 plaques and ivory pieces. And some of these, like the one above, they're on display in the Israel Museum. Um, they've even found an inscription with Jezebel's name on it. Um, but, but all of these ivory finds simply confirm to us what 1 Kings 22 has said. Hey, this is also something that's been found, and this is a, considered an incredible find by many. Uh, this is called the Moabite Stone. It was found at Dibon, which is east of the Dead Sea, this big thing here. It was found in 1868. It's currently housed in Paris at the Louvre. Pharaoh Jenkins writes about it, that this Moabite stone was set up by Misha, who was the king of Moab. That's why it's called the Moabite stone, set up by Misha, about 850 B.C. Misha had been paying tribute to the house of Amri, but he rebelled after the death of Ahab in 2 Kings 3 and verse 4. You read about it. The stone mentions David, mentions Amri, mentions his son Ahab, and it mentions at least 14 places mentioned in the Bible. It's an archaeological discovery that confirms people and places as we, we take a look at it. A couple more, and then we'll be 
finished here and conclude. But 2 Kings 20 and verse 20 says this. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, all his might and how he made a pool in a tunnel and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Hezekiah was the king of Judah and he fortified Jerusalem at the end of the 8th century B.C., which was just before the invasion of Sennacherib. And as a part of Hezekiah's building project, he brought water into the city of Jerusalem through a tunnel, which was carved from over half a kilometer of bedrock. There was a 6% gradient that was designed into the excavation to allow water to flow from the Gihon Spring. This map illustrates that, the Gihon Spring, down to the Pool of Siloam, which is where the tunnel ends. And the inscription that you see above, right here, this inscription, was at the entrance to the tunnel. But it notes how two teams of workers worked simultaneously from separate ends of the tunnel. Now, you'd expect something as big as a tunnel, right, to be found, uh, to be, to, to know where it is, um, certainly. And, and indeed it has. Um, this is a picture of the tunnel right here. You can still walk through this tunnel today. They had to dig all the mud and dirt out of it because it had been ignored for, for centuries. Um, but you can go to Jerusalem and you can walk through this today. Here's a person walking through Hezekiah's tunnel, which was built. You can see water there on the floor um, of the tunnel. There are a lot more neat archaeological things to, to talk about during the divided um, uh, kingdom. But let's, uh, let's think about the captivity and return as we finish up. Uh, the cylinder above, it's known as the Cyrus Cylinder. This is all writing on the cylinder, okay? Not writing that we can read because it's not in our language, obviously, or in our script. But um, it's known as the Cyrus Cylinder. It's housed in the British Museum. And the Cyrus Cylinder is considered an ancient bill of human rights. This cylinder tells of the capture of Babylon by Cyrus in 539 B.C. Now, of course, as we read Scripture... We realize that Cyrus allowed the captives of Israel to return to their homeland and to worship their own gods. Um, and the Israelites, they're not specifically mentioned on the cylinder, but the policies that you see written on the cylinder harmonize with what we read in 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 23 and in Ezra. 2 Chronicles 36, 23 says this, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. This was an incredible thing for a king to let his captives who were working for free and making him money to let them go and go back home and rebuild their temple and rebuild the walls. But Cyrus indeed does that. It's documented in Ezra 1 as well. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. He made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Cyrus Cylinder is in writing, right? Um, saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me. He has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Ju Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, which is in Jerusalem. Whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Cyrus, you might say, believes in religious freedom. Um, and he gives the Jews the right to express themselves religiously as they see fit. It allows them to go back to Jerusalem. This is the tomb of Cyrus the Great, which you can still go and visit today. Um, this is where he was buried. He's a character mentioned in Scripture and certainly lots of historical evidence proving he did exist. Even little things like what you read in Jeremiah 40 and verse 5 and the prophets are things we have evidence for. It says, while Jeremiah had not yet gone back, Nebuzaradan said, go back to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon has made governor over the cities of Judah. Now, this is the only time we read about Gedaliah. Scripture. Um, and yet he's got a pretty high position here. He's governor over the cities of Judah. It says, and dwell with him among the people. Uh, this little seal that you see right here um, is a seal that was found at Lachish. And the seal actually says, belonging to Gedaliah, 
who is over the house. Um, and that's what we read in Jeremiah 40, that he was over the house of Israel, over the cities of Judah, put in that position while the people of Israel were in captivity. We could look at a lot of things. I just want to finish with this quote here. Norman Geisler suggests, he says, in every period of Old Testament history, every period, and we've looked at the patriarchs, the invasion, the conquest. We've looked at uh, the United Kingdom, the divided kingdom. We've looked at the captivity and the return. So we've looked at many of the periods of Old Testament history. He says, we find that there is good evidence from archaeology that the scriptures speak the truth. In many instances, the scriptures even reflect firsthand knowledge of the times and the customs it describes. While many have doubted the accuracy of the Bible, time and continued research have consistently demonstrated that the word of God is better informed than its critics. In fact, while thousands of finds from the ancient world support in broad outline and often in detail the biblical picture, not one incontrovertible find has ever contradicted. No, it does not take much to instill doubt and to help people lose faith. Our world's becoming filled with bashers who make it their job to belittle the God of the Bible and to ridicule his believers. Yeah, I want you to know if you'll do some work and if you'll do some research and some real study uh, and not just believe every critic who has an ax to grind against God, you'll find interesting and compelling evidence for the veracity and the credibility of the scriptures. And of course, if the scriptural people, places, things, and events are true, then you need to start asking this question, is the message of scripture itself true? A message that calls us to repent. You need to be asking, is the main character of the scriptures real? And that main character is Jesus. And if all the people, places, things, and events can be trusted, we need to ask, can God's promises be trusted too? He's shown us that his word is real and verifiable, so maybe we should start considering his commands for our lives and his promises for our eternity. You can believe in the Jesus that's revealed in the scriptures. He is the one who was the fulfillment of so many prophecies. He is the one who performed those miracles that we read about in our scriptures. He is the one who died for our sins. And he is the one who was raised from the dead so that we might have a hope of eternal life. And he is the one who calls you to believe in him so that he might be your Savior and your Lord. He is Lord in Christ, and he calls you to repent and be baptized in his name for the remission of your sins. And if you want to do that, do that tonight while we stand.